<laughs> All right. So thank you for joining me for Oak Nights. This is our February edition, so we're going over first aid kit basics. Just to give you an idea of what we're going to go over tonight, we're going to talk about, uh, if you've done Oak Nights before, we're going to go over five points for first aid kit basics. And then we're going to come back around to this lovely display of first aid kit contents that I have out in front of me here and go through some of what the actual components in my personal first aid kit are to give you an idea of what maybe could or could not go into your own. Sound like a good plan? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get started uh, with, with, you know, first, why you even want to be carrying a first aid kit. I talk to a lot of people who head out into just their local parks or maybe they're just going on a really easy, really popular trail and they just carry a water bottle and maybe, maybe a snack and no first aid kit. First aid kits are part of what is commonly referred to as your 10 essentials or your essential systems that you wanna pack with you. And it's not because you're going to need it on every outing, but because you might. And it's that careful balance of being prepared for the what ifs and being rational and not scaring yourself with all of the things that might go wrong. So I really do encourage a light first aid kit and then being prepared for the adventure that you're going to be on. So you wanna prepare for what you're planning to do. If it's a small trip, then a small first aid kit's probably gonna be just fine for you. If you're going on a longer multi-day backpacking journey, you're gonna want supplies that are gonna get you through that. And you also wanna be prepared for the obstacles that you might encounter on your particular adventure. If you're doing a lot of hiking, blisters are something to be accounted for. If you're gonna be doing some climbing, then maybe you want something that's gonna provide you a little bit more protection. Uh, summer weather, definitely sunscreen comes into account things like that. So just making sure you're accounting for all aspects of your journey. There are some basics that I recommend in pretty much every first aid kit and those are going to be your basic adhesive bandages. They're going to be maybe some antiseptic, uh, something to clear antibacterial out of any wounds that you might get, and then some kind of anti-inflammatory or painkiller, so something oral or topical depending on you and what works best for you. Just if you do have something happen that can keep down any, any swelling, so say you twist an ankle, an anti-inflammatory is going to help keep down that swelling until you can get to the point of getting more thorough care. And that's really the point of a backcountry first aid kit. It's not to completely treat the wound beginning to end. It is care in the moment until you're out of the backcountry and back to civilization where you can get proper care for it. You also want to make sure that you're renewing your first aid kit periodically. So as you're going through, you want to take a look at least once a season is a good time to do it as you're transitioning maybe from summer into winter weather is a good time to do it or vice versa, winter getting ready for spring and summer adventures and go through and check for your expiration dates. Make sure things aren't out of date. Expired items in your first aid kit most of the time aren't going to do you any harm but they're no longer as effective. They start to hit a shelf life where they rapidly become less and less effective for use. So that's why those expiration dates are important. You also wanna make sure that you're renewing your supplies. If you've used up three quarters of your bandages last season, you wanna restock those before you head out on your next adventure. Self-care is a huge component with a first aid kit. My first aid kit is very much attuned to me and the things I know I'm going to need. If I'm taking any particular medications at a time, if I know that I have certain allergies I need to be prepared for, then my personal first aid kit needs to include those personal items to make it work for me. My first aid kit is not for everybody else around me, the exception being if I'm guiding a hike, in which case I'm prepared, of course, to take care of the people who are with me. But it's, it's for my personal self and those under my direct responsibility. And that's my fifth point is others with your first aid kit. I do talk to a lot of people who want to be prepared, not just for themselves, but in a good Samaritan, best intention way for those they might encounter in the outdoors who need help. And that's great, but that person should have a first aid kit that's tailored to them. You really want to make sure you're carrying supplies that are geared for you and those directly in your care. So in my case, if I'm solo hiking, that's just me. If it's me and my dog Bailey, then it means I have some canine first aid supplies in there. If I'm out with a group, then it means I have first aid supplies for that group within reason, and I'm reminding those that are with me to bring their personal essentials that they need to take care of their own first aid needs as well. So that could be extra medication. If they are diabetic, maybe they need some medication for that. 
if they have heart medications, making sure they're carrying extra heart medications, things of that nature. I also frequently remind those with children that it's a great opportunity to teach your kids about basic first aid by going out, but also carrying supplies that are essential for them. Unless you want everybody wearing dinosaur band-aids by the end of your hike. <laughs> so that's the quick rundown. If uh, you would like a copy in writing of that, it will be going out in the newsletter this month. So make sure you sign up for the newsletter to get a copy of those five basic points. It's also going to include a short first aid kit list of suggested items. These aren't brand name items. This is just going to be generic so that you can pick the brand that works best for you. But high level, the things that you would want to include or maybe include in your kit. So I do want to get into my own first aid kit. And this is where I think it's going to be a little bit more beneficial to folks to kind of see how I've fine tuned my kit over time. I tried to break this out in a way that makes sense. I've got a couple other hints for packing your kit that are going to come up as we go through this. And of course, if you have any questions, uh, ask live if you're here. And if you're watching this video later, hit me up with a comment and I will be sure to get back to you with answers to your questions as well. So a great place to start with any first aid is with knowledge. If you haven't taken any kind of a first aid class or course, whether it's a one hour workshop provided by a local organization or a multi-day in-depth course through an organization like Knowles, I highly recommend it because that will help you feel more comfortable, comfortable and prepared, especially if you find yourself getting into longer and more distant journeys. So for myself, I've taken a, a few different courses, which does include a multi-day wilderness first aid course with Knowles. Um, and so I've got a little handy dandy cheat sheet that I carry with me because in an emergency scenario, if that comes up and because I am responsible for others, this gives me a quick reference for some of the information that I might need. It's super lightweight, waterproof, rip proof, and I can fit it right in my first aid kit. I also, I don't carry this with me, but I wanted to bring it just as an example because it is a little bit bulky, but I also do keep reference for canine first aid because I often hike with my dogs. So for me personally, that's an item that I want to have on hand easily. I actually have a digital copy on my phone, so it's a device I'm already carrying. I have a quick reference available, and it's got quick suggestions for things. This does not replace a trip to the vet in a true emergency, but it helps me know how to handle things like a bee sting without having to panic and go, what happens when my dog gets stung by a bee? Is she allergic? Do I need to panic? Do I need to drop everything and rush back to the vet? By the way, for the record, Bailey is not allergic to bees. We learned this the hard way. Mm -hmm. And uh, dogs don't swell up the same way people do unless they eat them, then that's a whole other story. So that's a couple, a couple of pieces just as far as the knowledge to get you going. For myself, I did start with my first aid kit with just an off the shelf kit, which is a great foundation if you don't already have a first aid kit for a couple of reasons. One, it's going to get you a bunch of the things that you would commonly want to carry in a first aid kit without having to piece it all together. It also gets you a very handy, um, and in the case of this one, surprisingly sturdy, lightweight case that I can keep all of my first aid kit supplies in going forward. So this one, I like that it's got the nice bright orange color. It's easy to find in my pack. If I need to give somebody direction to where to find it in my pack, it's really easy to say. I always keep it in the same spot so that even if something happens and I'm maybe not quite cohesive or coherent in a moment and need to tell somebody where to find my first aid kit, it's always going to be in my pack on the right hand side in the bright orange square rectangle, but easy to find and identify. These handy little guides fit right inside as well and help give it a little form and uh, rigid shape, which is nice when you have a lot of loose items within it as well. Within that, I also have a little waterproof Ziploc. And this is just to keep some items a little extra dry. The outer layer is water resistant, but not waterproof. And you don't want to try to put on soggy band-aids. Hmm. I really am a fan of reduce, reuse, recycle. So a couple of options for carrying things. A lot of the times when you get a first aid kit, you'll get a lot of pills that come in these little single use packets. This one happens to be a non aspirin painkiller. And it's got just a single dose, two pills in it. And that's a lot of extra waste. Uh, it takes up a little bit more space than it needs to because these pills are, you know, the size of a fingernail in this packet. So I like these single travel size tubes for pills. 
And of course, you want to make sure you know what's in them. I don't recommend unlabeled bottles um, because it's hard for people to identify them. But that is one option. Another option, I have a little tin that I've reused. This one was mints. But this one's got some vitamin supplements in it that I carry with me. Not emergency supplies, but it goes into the first aid kit so that they're all in one space. So that's a couple of options. It keeps your pills from getting crushed because it's in a rigid container. It's still labeled so it can be identified. If you do want to reuse one of these travel size plastics, uh, wrapping it in tape and relabeling it so that you know what it is or somebody else might know what it is if they need to help you out is definitely recommended. The single size packs, they, like I said, they come in a lot of first aid kits. It's a great starting point. Take a look at how many you have in your first aid kit and how often you're gonna be out. This particular kit, when I first got it, had I think six different of these single size non-aspirin packets in there. And I'm not gonna use those even on one hike if I'm out, if I'm doing day hiking. Multi-day backpacking, different adventure, different length of time, that might be a different case. But for a day hike, that was a lot for, for just one person. So I went through and I sorted out some of those items that are gonna be more than I would need in a single day to lighten up just a little bit. It might not seem like a lot of weight, but when you start adding up all those little pieces that you can take out, it really can reduce the weight in your pack and that overall makes a better experience. So it's one of those little tidbits. A couple other things that you might want to have as far as these smaller size um, antiseptic wipes instead of a gel, it's just a little easier to manage and won't go everywhere. Uh, you can also use it to clean your hands, so if you are dealing with an open wound, maybe you've got a scratch, a scrape, a cut, then you can clean your hands uh, and make sure you're not touching it with dirty hands and fingers as well. Tums, in case of stomach issues, come in handy more than once on the trail, and again, nice small size, also fits into the travel size tube and keeps them from getting crushed and turning into powder. Sting relief is another handy one. There's a couple different ways that you can find that. I do have a, a gel version. I also have an uh, anti-sting wipe. One thing that I look at when I'm picking out what's going into my first aid kit is if it's safe for my dog and for children so that I can make sure that I've got things in my kit that will work for all members of my group, not just for myself. So that's a tidbit to take away as well. The same anti-sting pads that I carry will work for me and for my dog and she won't have any kind of a reaction to it. It's just something to keep in mind. Painkillers get trickier, so if, you're, if you've got a dog, maybe an older dog with arthritis and you've got particular pills for them, make sure you're packing something that is canine safe. Or if you happen to be one of those people that hikes with your cat, good for you. <laughs> and same rule applies, safe for your cat. When it comes to bandages, there's two ways to go. There's adhesive and non-adhesive, and there's various different sizes. So I wanted to touch on that as well. Similar to the single-use dose of pills, Bandages, when I first got this off the shelf first aid kit, I had like 24 band-aids in there. I'm not gonna use those in a single day, or if I need that many, I probably don't wanna like layer 24 in a row, I want a single bigger bandage. So make sure you're not carrying more than you need and you've got a few different sizes. So I do carry a few with me. I do have just your basic stereotypical bandage size adhesive. But I also, and I know you can't really see these through the package. I could try to hold them up to the light, probably wouldn't work. I carry a larger butterfly style bandage that'll go around maybe a knuckle, like a scraped knuckle. Some butterfly bandages. So if I do need to close up an open wound, I have that option. And then a larger adhesive bandage that's always sealed and sterile. On top of that, I also carry a couple of different variations with non-adhesive bandages. So I've got a wide single bandage, and I also have a roll of gauze that can be used if I needed to as a bandage. It can also be used to hold something in place. So multi-purpose, saves weight, saves space, can use it for multiple occurrences. If you are using a non-adhesive bandage, you need to keep it in place. Most of the kits that you're gonna get are gonna come with maybe one about this size, but it's an athletic tape like that cloth athletic tape that's meant to hold the bandage in place. I've got a bigger roll here as well that I've got from a first aid course that I took. They work well, but they're bulky, they're heavy, and they really have a single purpose. They also tear pretty easy. So as an alternate, I would recommend looking at either duct tape. This is, I know it's white, but this is actually duct tape. 
It will hold a bandage in place and it doubles as a way to repair any items that you might need to repair on the trail. Broken straps, broken trekking poles, any of your uh, gear that gets a rip, you can patch with duct tape. Multi-use, saves weight, one less thing to carry by not having to carry these plus a patch for whatever your gear might be. And you can get it in different sizes. So I have a couple examples. You can carry patches of it, just a single strip. These have a non-adhesive backing on them. Just keep them from sticking to, to anything. And that folds up nice and neat. Can slip right inside of your kit without taking up too much space. And then there's a, I don't recommend a lot of brands by name very often, but there's this one. <laughs> it's called Tenacious Tape. And it's actually stronger than duct tape. I've used this to repair clothes, to repair my tent, to hold a bandage in place. Super versatile. You can cut it to size, use it for what you need and it holds up great under days of wear and tear. So that is one that I definitely would recommend. Getting away from the adhesives, uh, there are also options carrying an ACE bandage. If you are prone to say a rolled ankle, this may be something you want in your own kit. But again, don't pack for all of the eventualities, pack for you and the things you know about yourself. I rarely carry an ACE bandage with me um, I am more likely to utilize an extra piece of clothing if I need to wrap something than have a piece of gear that is just for that. But after I did roll my ankle on a particular hike, for the next few hikes out, I carried one with me because I knew I was more prone to it while I was healing. A triangular bandage is an option for a sling, but again, I don't always carry it with me. If I'm in a bigger group and I'm carrying a more robust first aid kit, then this will be in there with me. But if it's just me, then I'm more likely to use an extra piece of my clothing to create a sling than carrying a single piece of gear just to do that one job. Did jump over and don't want to skip. Uh, for those who are prone to blisters especially, if you're not familiar with using moleskin or like a second skin, this is a great help and there's a couple of different forms out there that you can use. You can get one that's just a nice soft velvety texture, creates an extra layer that creates friction, or excuse me, reduces friction rather, between your foot and your footwear to help prevent blisters. Or if you've already got one and you're trying to protect it, you can get things like this where, and I know it's gonna be a little hard to see on the camera, but it's a foam padding, it's adhesive on one side, and then you can cut it to fit as needed to protect an area that maybe already has a hot spot or a blister forming. Keep anything from pressing against it. And then there's a breathable adhesive cloth membrane that can go over that to keep it safe and clean until you're back to where you can give it better care when you're done with your hike or adventure. Those have definitely been a lifesaver. You can see this one's got a couple pieces missing because I've used it. Um, not overly prone to blisters, thankfully, knock on wood. But those have definitely come in handy more than once. If you're really concerned about open wounds, cuts, maybe you're doing something that's a little bit more dangerous, maybe you're doing like a scramble or a really rocky area, and you're concerned about needing to clean a wound out, if you wanna go a step further than an antibacterial or an antiseptic, you can get these syringes that fit, they're very lightweight, in your first aid kit, non-needle tip, and you just use clean water to flush out an open wound with these. Again, this isn't something I typically carry when it's just me because I'll just use a, a bottle of water on it and I probably will be getting out pretty quick but if I'm where I might need to care for other people then this is an item that goes with me I also carry a way to sanitize water with me so I'll carry some tablets that'll quickly sanitize some water if I need to you don't want to put dirty water into an open wound of course so that's another piece that goes into my first aid kit the other items in my kit are kind of on that first aid, not first aid borderline piece, but I pack them together to save space and because I do try to get some multi-use purposes out of them. So one of those things is insect repellent. I've seen people classify this as first aid and not, so that's why it's kind of on the border. There's different ways to go about it. You can get a spray, you can get uh, an aerosol, or I've got these uh, insect repellent wipes that last for about eight hours that work great. So whatever insect repellent method works for you, depending on where you're at, time of year, what you need, packing that in just with your kit makes it easy to find and pull back out. Same thing for sunscreen, depending on 
time of year where you're at, um, the strength of your sunscreen is going to vary. Of course, you probably want to be wearing sunscreen on pretty much every adventure, but there's different strengths out there and different purposes for it. Don't forget in winter adventures, the snow is going to reflect all of that light back up at you. So it might not seem like you're going to get a sunburn, but you absolutely can. Same thing goes with your out on the water in the warmer months. All of that light's reflecting back up. So don't forget your sunscreen, but also like under your nose, under your ears, those little spots you won't think of typically. Another thing that I keep in mind is uh, rehydration salts. There's different ways to go about this. This one is not super tasty. This is an uh, emergency type of rehydration need you come across or push yourself too far. Someone who really needs some rehydration because they haven't been drinking enough water, they're not getting enough nutritional intake. This will help with some of those electrolytes. I prefer to get ahead of that and just have electrolyte drinks, uh, but this is, this is another option for the first aid kit just in case that's not doing enough. And then a couple of other repair items that can double as first aid kit pieces. And this is more for backpacking than day hikes, but I wanted to share because they do go into my kit. I have a piece of electrical, or not electrical, excuse me, elastic uh, tie that's meant for repairing a tent pole. And that works really well if you do need to hold something in place. It's just another piece. Plus it's small and goes with all my repair items. So into the same kit. I have a tent repair pole which can be used as a small splint very easily. It's not gonna be the most comfortable, but again, this is backcountry first aid. This is not going to the emergency room level first aid and getting something that's a perfect fit. This is getting you by until you can get to that point. So this small rigid pole can double as a first aid piece for me. It's one less thing I have to carry a splint on top of everything else by tying it into place or duct taping it into place until I get back to where I can get real first aid. One thing I didn't bring today, and I'm really sorry that I didn't, but it absolutely belongs in this kit, is a multi-tool. So in my case, I've got a multi-tool that includes a pair of scissors, a knife, a serrated blade, it's got tweezers, it's got a tiny screwdriver. So it is about the size of, maybe about the size of this emergency match stick holder, and a little heavier. But it doubles as a way to cut my bandages to size, as a way to pull out any splinters I may get, or bee stingers, uh, thistles, uh, anything along those lines, thorns. So it's got the tweezers for that. The tiny screwdriver has been handy for fixing glasses. So it's definitely a multi-use tool in every sense of the word. Absolutely belongs in this kit. And then just for the convenience of keeping everything together, when I'm backpacking, I do carry earplugs with me just in case I'm in an area where it's particularly noisy with other campers. If it's me, truly backcountry, of course I wanna be able to hear what's going on around me. But there have been instances where I'm in a campground and my neighbor snores. So my, my uh, earplugs do go in. I do have a, a little vision repair kit, eyeglass repair kit. So it's got a tiny magnifying glass, some extra screws, and a couple of safety pins. And those come in handy again. This is just a great place to keep them because it's a small container but they can repair items on my pack, pieces of clothing, hold a bandage in place. Um, very versatile, lightweight addition to the kit. Uh, the last couple of things that I have are just some odds and ends that make it into my first aid kit. I did a particularly long trip, so I did take a tiny pair of nail clippers with me because I wanted to be able to trim my nails while I was out there. Um, maybe you don't wanna know, but your toenails grow pretty quick and they'll wear through your socks. And I did not want that problem when I was on a two week hike. So mm -hmm. nail clippers made the cut. Uh, the emergency matches do make it into the kit as well. Because it's a rigid container, it's not chock full of matches. I use it to protect some of the smaller items and keep things contained and dry because it's waterproof. And then I do tend to carry an extra, uh, pick your brand, but feminine product, uh, tampon or a pad. They're incredibly absorbent and they come in handy if you do have a cut that's bleeding and you need to be able to uh, put something on to both keep pressure and, abs and absorb. So they're very handy, whether you're male or female, for a first aid kit addition, plus actual purpose as intended. So that's the contents of my first aid kit. Um, try to make sure I didn't forget anything for you guys. That's, that's, that's a little red. Oh, thank you. Thank you for pointing out. So the one thing I did skip over, because I 
got a little out of order there. In addition to insect repellent, this is a tick key. Oh. And so if you're hiking in the Pacific Northwest, uh, the east side of Oregon, Washington, out into Idaho, ticks are a bigger problem than on the rainier west side of the states. Uh, but if you get a tick, you don't want to just pull it out. You want to make sure you get the whole tick. And it's like the one thing that really creeps me out when I'm hiking. Spiders don't bug me anymore. Rodents don't bug me. Snakes don't bug me. But ticks, woof, man, every time. So the way that this works is it just fits over the insect and you twist and it pops them right out. Mm -hmm. Works really well. Um, it doesn't work on the tiniest of them, but it works on most of them. And the really tiny ones, you want to use a pair of tweezers. So, and you always want to make sure you get the whole tick out. I don't recommend a lot of the home remedies of things like trying to burn it out. That just comes with its own need for additional first aid. Um, I've heard of putting nail polish on them until they let go. Then you're just waiting for them to let go, which uh, you, the whole idea is to get them out as quickly as possible. Um, and drowning them out, it will take a really, really long time. Just tweezers or, or a tick key like this one. And you can pick these up at a lot of the different outdoor stores in the area. So. Um, very inexpensive, super lightweight, and it goes right into my first aid kit. So, and I picked the red, they come in different colors. I picked the red because it's easy to spot. Thank you for asking. Yeah. I had that, I had skipped something feeling. <laughs> and so, and it works on dogs. So, if you can get them to stand still, it mm -hmm. actually was easier than the tweezers because it doesn't pinch. So, uh, all of this is tried and true. If you have any additional questions, uh, please do hit me up and I will be happy to share uh, additional insights, whether it's gear that I carry, additional gear that I've tried, or if something's not on my list and you want to know why, let me know and we'll talk about that as well. So that's what I have for my first aid kit basics. Uh, keep an eye out. Like I said, if you haven't registered for the newsletter, get signed up for that. It's going to contain a checklist of items for you as well as some pointers on how to prepare your first aid kit for your own adventures. What I have for you today. I have one question. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts or tips? I was thinking about like when you are hiking in a different, like a different area of the states, and like what would be helpful information to look up. Specifically, I was thinking of like when I was in more like central eastern Washington. Then you have to be aware of like rattlesnakes mm -hmm. and how to handle that. So like animals weather obviously I was just trying to think like what are the different things I guess different plants but can you think of any other stuff that might be wise to research so you definitely want to know what you're heading into and I have a couple things that come to mind when you mention plants there's the the ones that people probably most likely are going to think of is poison oak poison ivy mm -hmm. and absolutely those are ones to watch out for but also be aware if the area you're going into has stinging nettles some people have more violent reactions than others and only certain parts of the plant are going to cause a reaction to you. Uh, there's also, especially more into the eastern side of the state, and I'm going to space on the name of it right now, there's a particular plant that has some per some really nasty thorns on it, and I'll look it up, and also I'll, I'll share this in the comments, because I've run into it out um, in eastern Oregon, specifically in Cottonwood Canyon, and it's really irrit irritating to dog paws. So for people, it wasn't such a big issue because you've got, assuming, assumedly, you've got foot protection on. Maybe you're hiking barefoot, I don't know. But for dogs, it can be a real issue uh, for them to get these thorns into their paws. And they were, they were a little bit more hooked is why they were such an issue and they were quite abundant. So just doing a little research on the area before you can go can help clue you into some of those things. Rattlesnakes, not as much of an issue on the west side of the state as the east side. Um, if you're, if you're bitten, of course, you want to get to medical attention as quickly as possible, you, child, dog, what have you. Um, you want to really, in that case, focus more on keeping heart rate low and not panicking because the increased heart rate is going to spread toxins throughout the body faster. Um, but I'm not aware of like a specific, for the rattlesnakes we have in the Northwest, thing that you can carry that's going to completely counteract that. Right. The, the whole idea is keep the heart rate low as much as you can and rush to medical attention. Um, it does remind me though, tourniquets, I get asked about tourniquets a lot. Mm. And um, my advice, whether it's something in my kit, something in your kit, uh, carrying a tourniquet, 
tourniquet comes up as the is the hot button item, but it's not necessarily the item that that's going to raise this question for people. Know how to use the gear you carry. If you don't know how to use it, then carrying it and trying to use it for the first time in an emergency situation could cause more harm than do good. And tourniquets come up for that because if you apply a tourniquet incorrectly, you can actually do more damage to the individual you're attempting to help than, than good and trying to save them. Um, but the same goes for, I mean, it's an extreme opposite. If you try to use a tick key and you didn't read the instructions first, it actually can pinch and hurt quite a bit. Don't ask me how I know that. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it can. So just knowing how to use your gear to prevent further injury or accident when you're really intending to do good for somebody. Um, and tourniquets are something I see people recommend for first aid kits all the time without first aid training. And, and so I just always advise against that. If you really think you want to carry it, then please get the training to go with it. Sorry, it was a little bit of a tangent from your no, question, okay. but it totally sparked <laughs> that in my mind as something I wanted to share. Yeah. That's all I got. All right. That was a good one. It was a, it was a twofer. I came up with an extra answer. <laughs> All right.